I did want to start my presentation by thanking some others. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank Elizabethtown College uh, for bringing me back here today. I wanted to also thank uh, my employer, uh, Bradford White Corporation. Uh, we'll talk about my path as far as where I got to where, where I got to, um, and particularly how I ended up with Bradford White, uh, which is actually a recent change for me. I uh, also want to thank some of my mentors that got me to this point in my career, uh, one of which I actually had the pleasure of having breakfast with this morning, uh, Terry Ludwig. Uh, also, Mark Tibbetts and Dan O'Donnell, none of which I assume many of you know, but uh, very, very important to me uh, in my career. Also wanted to say thank you to my wife and family, uh, Anna. She actually was a student here at Elizabethtown with me, and I have to picture her uh, as well. In fact, I think when she, I sat there, she sat somewhere over there uh, for a lot of our classes. Um, and uh, she's been, been a rock. Uh, in my career for, for some other, obviously, uh, things as we've gone in my life. So uh, whenever I've prepared for a presentation, I always have my wife take a look at it. And it didn't matter if it was for this or something within my department or uh, other folks, because I always felt that she could be pretty honest with me. And, uh, you know, I asked her, how could I prepare for this presentation for this room, considering, you know, my path here? And how can I make this topic of me actually the thing that, that that I'm talking to you about today, uh, interesting. And again, in her brutal honesty, uh, Greek, New Jersey in tone, she said to me, Ryan, you can't. It's you, you're boring. Um, so I'm gonna try to dispel that myth today as I present uh, my topic of me and kind of my career path to you. So, so my story. So my story actually starts with this picture here. Um, you may know him, right? You guys know that, that guy in the middle, the professor? Okay. Um, if you look real close up here in the corner, you see that there's some bunny ears behind him. And I'm actually like directly to his right, or, uh, but well, let's look to your left. Uh, that is not me doing that to him, though. I just want that on the record for the video camera, uh, that that is not me giving him the bunny ears. And my wife is actually standing immediately to my left, or it would be your right. So she's actually in this picture as well. But uh, my family's history actually starts back in 1948. My grandfather went to college here. Um, he graduated with a bachelor's of education, uh, passed away about a decade ago now. My aunt graduated from Elizabethtown College. She met uh, all, uh, my uncle here in, back in 1975. I'm not that old, uh, but I graduated in 2007. I also graduated from Elizabethtown with a master's in business administration in 2014 with one of the first cohorts to do so. So that's me on the far right, back corner, um, and this is a great group of people as well uh, that I've had a lot of time with over the years. I wanted to mention though that I was, I am a Blue Jay, all right, but that wasn't the first thing that I was. I was actually a bear, and if anybody lives in Elizabethtown, you know exactly what I'm talking about because I'm a product of Elizabethtown. I was uh, born and raised here. Uh, I went to middle school, high school, undergraduate, and also MBA all through the fine institutions of E-Town. Uh, we now live in Philadelphia, my wife and family, so we don't live here anymore. But um, I will say that recently I lost a bet with my wife that if the Eagles won the Super Bowl, I would get a tattoo. Um, believe it or not, they did win the Super Bowl that year. I made the bet. Actually, something else happened to my family that year, which I'll tell you about. But um, so at this point, I haven't done the tattoo yet, but I'm contemplating it being Elizabethtown, just based on, on my roots and my history. So speaking of my wife, that's a picture of us uh, this year. We went to Jamaica uh, for a wedding. I was the best man in the wedding. I think I'm actually wearing somewhat of the same outfit as I look up there today. Uh, and uh, those are our two children. So we have uh, Will. He's five months old. Uh, he is, speaking of that Super Bowl championship, he is the product uh, of that Super Bowl win. Um, there's been a lot of those kids that came out of that uh, era and that weekend, and Will happens to be one of them. <laughs> and uh, that's my son, Joey. I love that picture of, of my son on the bottom because that just represents his personality totally. I show you these pictures because career is important, and we'll talk about my career path, but your family is also really important. And, you know, we aren't what we do. I know maybe you'll hear that a lot in your careers as you get into them. You know, you'll ask, be asked, what do you do? 
And you'll answer, well, I'm this, you know, a financial analyst or a marketing person. But I'm here to tell you is that what you do is not who you are. All right. And that's, that's an important lesson that it took me <laughs> 10 years or so to recently learn. But, uh, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't work hard in a career. You know, it's a tool. Your career is a tool to uh, obtain the life that you want, all right, the objection, objectives that you want for your own family, for yourself. Um, and again, it's really important. So, so here, this is my career uh, in a nutshell. So I work in and I've worked in the HVACR industry for about these 10 years since I started. So with a raise of hands, or actually, could somebody just tell me? Then we know what HVACR actually stands for. It's obviously an acronym, but any guesses? Yep. It's refrigeration. HVACR, you hear it sometimes called HVAC. Um, this is the underbelly of our economy. I think a lot of people don't know how big this industry is, and they don't have an appreciation for it until something's wrong with it. But here are the facts, all right? So $621 billion is spent annually in the U.S. on HVACR. Now, there's 141 million workers roughly in the U.S., about 2.5 million of which work in this business alone. 700,000 are in manufacturing. Um, and, and I gave you another statistic here, about 112 million work in the private sector. So if you take 112 you know, into the 141, the rest of those are going to be various government jobs, which is about a third of the economy, which is kind of frightening. Uh, we'll talk about my role and my experiences with government. Uh, hopefully no government people or political science people in the room. But um, by 2020, the BLS estimates that 95,000 new jobs are going to be available in HVACR. And we're going to talk about why that is. It's not because this is a fast, progressive, you know, hockey stick growth industry like technology or healthcare. It has more to do with the age of the workers in it. And there's a perception problem about working in this business. Um, it's not a sexy business. There are many people that when you hear that you work in the HVAC business, you have an immediate reaction. Dare I will just say it. I've heard things like they are the rejects of high school. They are the butt crack plumbers. But these people are the ones that you all will call when your HVAC don't work and you have to deal with. And so I think we need to think about that differently. There are about 110 million residential homes in America, all of which are heated and cooled in some variety. Okay, that's just residential homes. I didn't even give you the statistics on commercial buildings, institutional buildings, such as Elizabethtown College. Um, this is the comfort business. It's a commodity that we all take for granted. Also, I will argue for this room, is something you ought to be interested in. You know, I've seen some of these Eminem Mars lecture series. I've seen the guys, you know, in uh, such things as maybe marketing for technology companies. Maybe they're in finance. That all sounds boring to me when I think about HVAC because it's opportunity. It's a lot there. In fact, there's so much opportunity that if you tuned into the presidential campaign, I'm not going to talk about politics, but if you tuned into the presidential campaign, Donald Trump, uh, actually one of his first days on the job or in that interim period, saved carrier jobs from being exported to Mexico, carriers in the HVACR business. Uh, Hillary Clinton mentioned uh, Johnson Controls another large publicly traded company and related to tax inversions and this, this idea of corporate structures being overseas and the tax rates and tax revenue being offset. And Paul Ryan also, you know, the number one employer in Wisconsin, maybe you don't know this, is Johnson Controls. They're the number one employer. And so there's a lot of these publicly traded companies that are available for you to purchase if you're into investing, such as A.O. Smith, Ingersoll Rand, which owns a lot of the brands like Train, if you've ever heard of Nothing Stops Like a Train. Lennox, Honeywell, Honeywell is a big uh, company in this business. Uh, United Technologies, as we mentioned, with uh, Carrier. This book is so important as I talk to folks about the HVAC business, um, at least in my experience. It's called The New Geography of Jobs. It's by a gentleman called Enrico Moretta, uh, pre president, well, past President Obama recently put out a list of 20 books to read. This was on the list because it's so important to our economy. I picked it up because I thought it was interesting. 
But here's what it says, all right, in a nutshell. You can kind of see the three examples here. But that the, as the economy gets more efficient, the labor productivity means that there will be less hours worked by those particular employees. There is a hollowing out effect going on in the middle class, all right, and, and it's related to jobs. So things like factory workers, bank tellers, those jobs are being lost to technology. Just read the computer, or read um, Wall Street Journal, and you'll see that, uh, that McDonald's, for example, is trying to replace some of those uh, folks that are taking your order with kiosks, okay? Everybody knows those jobs are kind of being hollowed out, but what you may not know is that there are other jobs like that, such as graphic design. I know that maybe, hopefully there's no graphic designers in the room. But um, things like that are becoming tools that are developed by WYSIWYG. You know, what you see is what you get. You don't need to know coding to do websites, design stuff. Those jobs are being lost at a rapid pace. They're being outsourced. But I'm here to tell you that jobs that require, and according to the book, non-routine tasks are not being outsourced today. So what is a non-routine task? Things that are abstract, they're manual, they, they do much better in the face of automation. Things like carpenters, house cleaners, and HVAC techs. These guys are going to still be around because they need to service equipment. They need to install equipment. They have to be available. This book does a great job of laying the foundation for that and also for, you know, for a lot of folks that are in the political space, helping derive public policy around how do we support apprenticeship programs? How do we make sure that the trades and the folks that are doing the labor are supported fairly? And um, instead of perhaps, dare I say, getting Elizabethtown College education, that the people getting the Votech schools, those jobs are going to be in demand and they are already in demand, especially in this industry. But there's also a lot of jobs for you all and I'll talk about that too. So I debated whether or not I was going to actually like show you this YouTube clip. Instead, I'm just going to tell you it because I thought it would um, detract a little bit from the speech. So anybody seen the movie Juno? Maybe you all are too young for that. Okay, C1, a couple hands. It has a lot of really good um, actors in it when you look back at the movie. Um, let's see, you got uh, Jennifer Garner's in it. You got uh, that gentleman there on the left, J.K., I think it's Simmons. Yeah, J.K. Simmons. You have Jason Bateman, Michael Cera. So these people made a lot of really cool movies. So if you haven't ever seen Juno, just watch it. It's a great movie. But there's a scene in the movie where Juno is pregnant and she's going to give up the baby. And Jennifer Garner's character is talking about, you know, oh, I, I've always wanted to be a mommy. I've always wanted to be a mother. W you know, what have you wanted to be, J.K. Simmons, whatever his name was? And without missing a beat, he replies, in the, in the heating and, and cooling business. And whenever I show that to students, it all gets a chuckle because none of you are thinking about going in the HVAC business. You've never been taught about this business and how lucrative it is. And it, again, sort of his delivery, he's a little bit dry sense of humor, but uh, more or less, it leads into my point about the statistic and how dire the situation is for our industry, for the industry that I'm in. So Electric and Gas Industries Association put out a study and they said, this just came out last year, they said that they're certainly an aging workforce. 25% of which will be retirement age by 2020. So let that sink in for a while. The people doing the installation work and repair work, 25% of those are going to be gone by next year. They're going to be retired, out the door. So we're going to have a lack of blue collar workers and it's, going, it's already approaching epidemic proportions. Let me give you another statistic that came out of this study. They said that there were an expected number of 15% growth annually, or CAGR, so compound annual growth rate, 15% uh, every year in the next couple, five, five to 10 years uh, in this sector related to HVAC, so 15%. The national average of all jobs averaged together is 7%. Seven. So we are double what the average is compared to the loss of jobs. That's a big problem for, for this industry. But I would say, that's an, that's an opportunity. <laughs> that's an opportunity for people in this room. And you may not know it, that these jobs are local jobs. That's not just you're moving to Philadelphia where I live now. They're here. They're all over the globe. All right. So here's my background. So again, that's the industry, but here's my background. So I mentioned this before, uh, MBA undergrad from, from here, from Elizabethtown, 2014, 2007 respectively, 10 years in the industry. I actually wrote a book. Um, I just kind of mentioned this as sort of a cheap ploy, I guess. 
Uh, but I wrote this book last year. Uh, it's available on Amazon. Again, no, no pressure. Uh, and I do have a copy of it here, so it's not just like a picture. Okay, so it actually does exist. Um, I'll leave it here if anybody wants to look at it. But the book I wrote um, about my lessons, so it's kind of timely that I get a chance to talk about uh, this issue and my career because I put a lot of it to print. So a lot of you know, these things I'll talk about today is in here, but you know, a couple topics that were in the book, things like using the behavior tool of the nudge. Everybody hear of the nudge real quick? Anybody hear about this tool? No, none? All right, so the nudge, really briefly, again, you can read it in the book. I'd be happy to talk about it afterwards, um, is a behavior change method. It says, we're going to automatically opt you into something to get you to change your behavior. People that the most success comes in the 401k uh, submissions of employees, okay? So when you join the workforce, employers and others are like, you got to get into you know, retirement accounts. Day one, right? The nudge, what it did was, it said, you don't have a choice. If you're going to be working at my company, we're putting you in the 401k. And the only way to get out of the 401k is you got to opt out, not opt in. The nudge is a great concept, and it works in a lot of scenarios, one of which I used in my career. Um, I think I am going to talk about that later. I also talked in the book about negotiating tricks, some stuff that's maybe a little counterintuitive, you know, things like, you know, sometimes you'll hear you got to be tough, you know, or uh, negotiating is like sort of this um, game almost. What I found is that honesty has always been my best negotiating tactic. You know, I'm honest about the things that I want and the research that's necessary to get them. By the way, uh, the cover of this book, some people have asked me, is that me running in the bottom? Uh, I'd love to take credit for that's me running, but it isn't me running. Uh, but it does kind of look like me. So uh, The last thing I would mention here is, you know, I've spent my career so far working in government affairs. I've done some data analysis. I've worked on business improvement projects. A lot of my, let's call it my actual job title is marketing. So I do a lot of marketing stuff, but I'm more on the data side of marketing, less the creative side. Uh, and I've had a, some really cool opportunities throughout the years, which I'm going to impart to you on some of the projects and how you might be able to use it. I also am a local mentor for the uh, SCORE program. So has anybody here heard of SCORE? One? Okay. So uh, SCORE is also an acronym, but it stands something for more or less retired executives. SCORE is changing this model that they want young people to be mentors, people like me. So if you own a small business in Montgomery County where I live and you sign up for SCORE, you can get free mentoring about how do you start that business. How do you write a business plan? What are good marketing things to do? Uh, and so me, along with a, a cohort of other people, help start up businesses. And I've been doing this for about two years. It's one of the coolest things I've done uh, since post-career other than my actual, or post-college other than my actual career. Uh, it's sort of like giving it forward. You know, it's a really cool thing. And then lastly, I have a, a really uh, small consulting business. I actually have one client there that I'm doing some work for related to marketing uh, and also government affairs. And I kind of mentioned that only because these are kind of things that I do, but it's not my day job. These are the stuff I do on the side. <laughs> this is all the stuff I'm doing elsewhere. Uh, elsewhere. So, um, and I did win a few awards uh, in my industry. I didn't put them on the slide, but I just wanted to mention that. So I've had, a, had some really cool opportunity there as well. So I'll quickly run through the three companies I worked for in my career, and they all tied to HVAC. Um, but the first one is uh, APR Supply Company. I was uh, hired right out of college for that. It was my first job. So you guys remember 2007 is when I graduated from here. But I would just mention something that, does anybody know what happened in 2007, 2008, 2009? Market crash. Market crash. Market crash. Um, though I didn't talk about this uh, formally, I will mention it. The use of persistence. I went on 22 job interviews after I graduated from Elizabethtown College because nobody was hiring. These guys took a chance on me, and I am so grateful today that they did. Uh, they are, they're a great, excellent company, family-owned business based in Lebanon. Uh, as you can see, they have 40 locations throughout four states. Uh, and what they do is they fill the vertical between the manufacturer making products and selling to, to the end user. In, the case, in our case, it was the contractors. Uh, they don't do a uh, very limited role in any kind of end user, homeowners, uh, but uh, they do distribute products in the middle. When you get out of college and maybe start to learn more about businesses, you'll find there's a lot of these middle wholesale and distributors out there in different industries, different selling different products, right? HVAC isn't the only vertical. 
um, but very interesting. And so I work with them. And there's a lot of big companies in this space too, companies like Ferguson, uh, HD Supply, Granger. Maybe some of you have heard of that company. They do some national advertising. Uh, but they fill this uh, niche of selling uh, and providing products between um, in the channels I've described. I also want to mention with this job, I did all the jobs. Out of so anybody in here, uh, I'm assuming most of you are management uh, degrees. Yes, raise your hands, a couple. Um, so I was a management degree, and APR hired me to, do, to be a management trainee. So I came in day one to be a trainee. What they didn't tell me about that job was, that meant that you had to go do every job first. I thought because I had the degree, man, I could just manage people and things and processes. <laughs> that was a rude awakening, right? I got a chance to go in and do all the jobs. So my first job was I worked overnight. I worked in the warehouse. I worked with all kinds of different people. I drove truck. That truck that you see in this picture, I actually delivered products. <laughs> they made me go get my uh, certification to drive that. I did that. I worked at the branch. I worked at corporate. I worked uh, in admin roles. That all uniquely prepared me for my next two jobs. So if there's a lesson in there for you, don't think you're getting your dream job when you first start. You got to work for it. And I wasn't afraid of rolling up my sleeves to do that. And this was a great example. And they're a great company. That led me to the Thermostat Recycling Corporation, where I became the executive director. This program is a really kind of fascinating program, and none of you have heard about it. <laughs> but actually, with a raise of hands, again, have any of you seen one of these? Have you have one in your house, maybe? OK, we see a couple, all right? Um, this product is a mercury-containing thermostat. It controls your HVAC equipment, all right? Maybe you know it when you're like, oh, I'm too cold. I turn that thing down, right? That product has an ampule inside of it that has mercury in it. About 20 years ago, Honeywell, White Rogers, and General Electric said, we have a problem. We sold 100 million of this product over 50 years, and people are going to be throwing them in the trash. It has mercury. What are we going to do about this? So they created a nonprofit to, to handle and manage the take back of this device. And so this made me, from that regional job, learning all the unique parts of the business and HVAC, to now the national spokesperson for thermostat recycling on a very niche product. So the way that it worked was a contractor would take these off the wall, generally. Again, others could take it off the wall. They would dump them off at the wholesale distributor, which had one of these recycling containers. All these thermostats came back to the manufacturers that paid for their disposal. If you're familiar at all with corporate social responsibility, uh, sustainability, or other kind of green movements, this program fits right in that niche. But, and, and the manufacturers did this program before all those things were reality. They, they were the first EPR, Extended Producer Responsibility Group, to exist. Now you have batteries, you got paint programs, you have uh, tires, you have mattresses, all funded by manufacturers at the end of life of a product to safely and sustainably take it back. In our case, this was a cradle to grave product. Okay, so that meant that the product was going to be recycled and never to be reused. Okay, you weren't going to take mercury and reuse it. But in those other examples that I'm mattresses and others, they, there's a market for that. Steel, uh, you know, and mattresses have a com their commodity that's worth something. There's downstream markets for that. And so I ran this program for about five years. I had a chance to go across the country. Um, so let me give you some of the stats on that, no pun intended. I visited 1,300 wholesale locations in 22 states. One year I had 150 overnights that the International Holiday Inn, or the Holiday Groups, or IHG, otherwise known as Holiday Inns, sent me a free pair of golf clubs because I spent so much time in those hotels. By the way, that was before kids. <laughs> um, and I, all I did was go talk about this issue. I said, here's how we educate people on the, uh, taking these back and what's the mechanism to do so, and that the manufacturers are doing a great job here. They have this program. That ha so, and somewhere around 2006, the first state law passes on this program. Here comes the government. The government says, we need to regulate this process because it's not happening enough. You don't know what you're doing. We need to insert ourselves. 
the last couple years that had been my job. I had fought the environmental groups on how do you effectively take back this product? What are the tools that you can use? Incentives. Are there disincentives? Things like enforcement, okay? If you today threw out one of these in the trash, could the EPA come after you? I had to testify on this issue. I was in courthouse or state houses. I spoke to politicians. I was in front of environmental um, uh, agencies. So here in Pennsylvania, we have the DEP. I was talked to them. In fact, the DEP was one of my best relationships here in Pennsylvania. I did that for a long time. And what I learned in that process was how to manage a board. People that had manufacturers that are big Fortune 100 companies that said, guys, we want to take this stuff back safely, but cost effectively, where then you had on the other end of the spectrum, folks that said, you're not doing enough. You need to buy a Super Bowl ad on this issue. I literally sat in California and had someone tell me in the regulated offices and the environmental community say, this is so important, Mercury, you got to buy a Super Bowl ad and try to explain, explain to them ROI, cost effectiveness, the channel, right? How did these actually get deinstalled? And those battles shaped me. They shaped me a lot of ways. Um, I was a spokesman. I, it made me think critically and strategically. This is where I transitioned to being that manager, to being a strategist. This is where it happened. And it happened on the job. And it was sort of um, one of those experiences, again, that I wish, I don't wish. I, I'm glad I had it because it was very difficult. It was a hard job. It's still a hard job. This company's still around. Anybody want to apply for it? The job's available today. <laughs> um, but it is incredibly difficult because we were trying to prove a negative. And so I viewed this job as my industry volunteerism. I said, I'm not going to retire here, but I was going to learn a lot and think strategy, strategy and strategically about how do you do this more effectively and have those battles. And I did. And it led me to where I'm at today. So the company that I currently work for is Bradford White Corporation. This is my career inflection at this point. I believe this is where my career has gone from all the practices, all the stuff, to putting it all into focus, right? And working on big picture, big problems in, in our industry. And it's funny because I'm now, I was out of the business of managing end of life products, now to selling new products. I got into that side and I got into which Bradford White is developing, I'm now working on a project that we're working on a connected water heater. All right? And I'm going to talk about that. It's pretty cool. Pretty cool technology. Um, its focus is around the, uh, a phrase. Are you guys familiar with the phrase Internet of Things? Anybody hear about that? Alexa? Okay. The connected movement, smart home movement, is going to be huge. It already is, is huge. It's only going to grow quickly. Uh, Appliances in homes, such as water heaters, are going through this transformation. Uh, lots of appliances are. Bradford White happens to be the third largest uh, manufacturer of water heaters in North America. Okay, they're about 20% market share. Uh, they sell globally. They have a million or a billion in annual sales. They have 1,600 employees. They have three manufacturing facilities. It's all listed here. But the thing that I found most interesting about them they never have deterred far from who they are. This company believes in the professional trade. Today, as we're talking, they still sell to a professional installation only. That is an interesting problem and also one that I'm going to talk about in my career with you all as I give you the five lessons. I have five lessons for you. But uh, they're in an inflection point. Their competitors that are number one and two in the market sell to retail today. Ream and A.O. Smith. What they're doing, they sell to Amazon. They sell to Home Depot and Lowe's. They sell to big box stores. And you're like, why don't we just do that? Why not? A water heater has components that have gas. There's electrical hookups. There are venting requirements on this product that if you blow up your house, you're going to be liable for. If a plumber or a contractor does it, somebody that does probably 10 to 15 of these a week, do you think they're going to make the same mistakes in your house? No. That's a value. It's a value. And so 
And these are big questions that our company is, is dealing with, but it's also opportunity because they're hiring folks like me. They're hiring people at that num a good number two within a department to become the number one in the department because we need to solve some of these big uh, questions. By the way, this company also has four um, total business units. You have Bradford White Water Heaters, you have Lars, you have Nile Steel Tanks, and Bradford White Canada. Um, if I didn't mention this already, we sell these products globally. Globally. We have, I believe, I started to look at this, I believe we have sold a product in every continent. Okay. So in Africa somewhere, we have a solar hot water heater. All right. That solar hot water heater takes a solar panel, goes into our water heater system, heats up through that element, and now you have hot water for countries like that. Uh, and there's all kinds of interesting challenges around selling in different countries, but um, that's not my expertise, but I would say it's a really important thing as Bradford White figures out who we're going to be, retail, global sales, uh, and where the competition is. So this is the part of the presentation that I want to impart to you all my gray hair wisdom, all right? Yes, I have some up there. I'm starting to see it. But there's five key lessons here that I've found in my career. Take out the HVAC part for a second, all right? Forget that. These are things you can learn as you start any career, all right? As you become managers, as you begin to form, you know, what your job prospects look like, I want you to hearken some of these. Take one away. All right, I know there's five, but I want you to take one away. Remember that presentation I heard in E-Town from that guy. Maybe you don't remember me, but there's five. Pick one. Pick one of these. Number one, manage from the heart. I had a boss that said to me, your job is going to be to manage a few of these people. And I said, I'm a business degree, management degree. I got this. I know how to do this. And I had a rude awakening. <laughs> I had to figure out how do I connect with people that were my subordinates that were across generational divides, right? People that were different than me. And I failed at that. I failed at that. And how I got better was my boss gave me this book. And he's like, look, I could have told you how to fix that, but I want you to read this book. And the book was called Managing from the Heart. This book's been out there a while. It has a lot of undertones in religion, okay? So if religious management books aren't your thing, then don't read it. But the, there's, a, there's a story here that I, I, have, I share it to everybody I talk to, uh, the mentor, the score program to every day. There's two ways to manage relationships um, and using the shepherd and the sheep, you know, for those that have that kind of background, understand religion and the context. But... Um, so the shepherd, so let's take the vendor relationships for a while, for a minute, okay? Then I'm going to talk about employee management using the book's concept. So vendors, they have this concept in the book, and it talks about, you know, deriving the wool from the sheep, okay? So in other words, I'm a customer, you're the vendor, I need to get something from you. And there's two ways to get that wool, all right? You can either shear the sheep, which keeps that sheep alive, right? He might be a little uncomfortable, He's cold, you know, he doesn't like it very much, but he's, he'll be okay, right? Or you can skin the sheep, all right? You still got the wool off of him or her, but that relationship is probably dead, okay? Either way works, but the lesson in the book is learn to choose which one is right. And ultimately, they obviously they lean more towards sharing the sheep, okay? Keeping the relationship alive because it's repeat business. The other example that they gave in the book was this idea about employee management, again, using the shepherd uh, and the sheep. Um, the shepherd, in this case, has a staff, right? Maybe you've heard this analogy, carrots, sticks, things like that. But the book talks about this idea that when you're managing employees, you have to think about how do you prod them along, okay? You know, if they got to get within this gate, this fence, analogy, you can use that staff. Okay, it's a tool. But that staff, you can either club them over the head with and drag them there and get them there, or you can gently prod them to go through. I have found, after I learned my lesson the first time, that managing from the heart is a much more powerful tactic than not managing from the heart. And using these kind of principles, the idea of nudging, shearing, other, or other ways. 
and honesty is powerful. All right. So actually, I have a quote here from one of my vendors on this issue uh, that, that I had. Uh, he actually has this on my LinkedIn page, so you can see it there. I'm not didn't just make this up. Uh, so I asked him, you know, write write me a LinkedIn recommendation, Mr. Vendor. Please do that because you and I are good good pals. He writes the following: Ryan has from day one brought vision and change management to the TRC. So when I was at the thermostat company, he is fair and he's focused on successful delivery. Okay. I just want to point out something about this that I just found so fascinating when he wrote that, and I've thanked him for it. He didn't say he's the best. He's easy to work with. He's he'll, so understanding. He said he's fair. That, to me, is managing from the heart. You're not always like you accept everything that happens, but the way that you react to it, you're very honest about it. You're fair. That is a huge lesson from this book and one that it literally manifested itself in the, the recommendation. The other thing I'd mention here is, look, what, what's E-Town College's motto, right? Education for service, I believe, if I got that right, right? Serving others has served me well in my career. Servant leadership, you'll hear that term um, out there. Those are things that help you uh, to promote your own career, but also promote the objectives of the department, the company, serve others first. And also, I would mention, I, I've developed a personal mission statement that reads something to this effect. Um, I'd be happy to share it with any of you if you'd like to see it. Number two, don't us underestimate the value of relationships. This one, again, you're not going to read in any collegiate book, I feel like. Warren Buffett had a great quote on this. You know, it takes 20 years to build a reputation and five minutes to ruin it. If you think about that, you'll do it a little differently, okay? Maybe it's a little bit of managing from the heart principles, like treat everybody fairly. But there's a couple lessons in here that I've learned in this one about relationships. The first is, is that you're always selling, okay? I just want to make sure you guys understand that, all right? I didn't come in here today wearing sweatpants, maybe some other kind of, you know, outfit. I wore a suit, tie, did my hair today, actually took a shower, okay? You're always selling. People are judging you whether or not you want to admit. That means online. That means in person. It means in a lot of different regards. And in most cases, you have 10 seconds or so to have one over that perception of somebody. Okay, That's important. But here's the other part about the elevator pitch that nobody tells you, that if you rehearse it, if you practice it, if you make it unique, honest, and ultra-specific, you will be way better than your competition. This can manifest itself in when you interview for jobs, when you're trying, you know, when you're in a competitive situation, or let's say, again, in my case, you're just out there working, okay? What do you do? How do you do it? And being able to say it very specifically and, and uh, to the point. This also includes a philosophy that I have learned and my wife and I joke a lot about because probably like a lot of you, maybe you go out to eat, maybe you use other businesses for services. You always know ugly when you see it, I guess, when you see bad business service because you're like, that's bad, but then you never kind of really acknowledge the good ones. But let me give you a tool, uh, again, about relationships. Thinking like an owner. This is a, this is a lesson that I learned uh, at, when I was at APR. The idea here is that when you think like an owner, you think about the way you approach the relationship differently, okay? You think more high level, 30,000 foot. You don't think, boy, this is just a transaction that I got to take care of. And why I mentioned my wife about this is oftentimes when we hear and see bad service, let's say in a business, we say to ourselves, man, if that server thought like an owner, they wouldn't have blown me off. They wouldn't, you know, they would have said, how can I serve you? How can I help you more so than just neglect me, ignore me, you know, put me on hold for 30 minutes, right? If more people in businesses thought like owners, businesses would be more prolific. So how does that look like? It all starts with culture, right? So culture matters. If the owner is saying, I want you to think like me, that's a powerful tool versus you going into a company that's kind of like, just do your job, stay in that department, be on, you know, this. Because if you're always boxed in, you'll never understand the big picture of the industry. You'll never understand maybe the competitors, and you'll never be able to build effective relationships. So think like an owner is, is important. Here's another t a tactic about relationships. Again, I had to learn the hard way. Naturally in, uh, introverted, became more extroverted. 
as I graduated because I saw it was necessary. Uh, but be interesting, all right? Have something to say in most conversations. You don't have to be the, the, the topic, all right? You don't have to know everything about the Philadelphia Eagles. But you'd have to know they won last year. Be like, hey, are you a Philadelphia Eagles fan? Oh, that's cool. Like, know enough to be interesting. And, and not only personally, but professionally, okay? Don't be, don't just get into this one, one uh, trick mindset. Because what happens is, when you're not talking and you're listening, that's actually building a relationship, whether or not you know it. People like to be listened to. People like to hear um, th and acknowledge that they're being you know, followed along with. Again, very simple um, lesson, but very important. I'd also mention that this, over the years, has really manifested itself uh, with work in trade shows. And I wanted to show you a few pictures here of uh, folks that I've met over the years via trade shows. Um, so a couple of these are, you know, me giving some awards out that we came up with, but uh, some are just long-standing relationships. This guy here in the middle uh, used to work with him at a different company. He then went to work at a different company, different industry, and we just kept in touch, and all of a sudden now we're back in the same industry again. So, like, we're, we're always, you know, like, never too far away from each other. And this is where the power of social media and LinkedIn and these other tools really comes into play making and cultivating relationships. You can't only do this online, you have to do it in person. And the value of trade shows, at least for me in my business in the HVAC world, was that it allowed me to go into the room and be curious. I could go into an event and be like, oh, there's a booth there of something I don't know anything about. I'm gonna be interesting and I'm gonna ask a question about it and just try to learn. Just because there's no relation to my job doesn't mean that someday it won't or that I may find that interesting depending on what they say. So that's something that uh, is very important, I think. The last thing I'd mention about my industry, uh, maybe it's different than finance. Again, I'm sorry to bash on the finance guys or the accounting guys or whatever, but my industry, these guys are really easy to get along with. They are just salt of the earth, blue collar. They're, down, they, they, they're just down for talking to you because maybe it's because maybe they've been the rejects of society in some cases, but they love to talk about the things they're doing and how they can help. Um, and that's the kind of workers that in industry people I've always rallied behind. The blue collar types, roll up your sleeves, get the work done. You're not bigger than what you just are. And maybe that has a lot to do with being E-Town. Maybe I should get that tattoo, you know? You know. Middle school, high school, blue collar Lancaster County, but that's always hit me uh, in a certain way, so. Number three, uh, the importance of mentors. This one, um, also very near and dear to me. I, uh, this is a quote from Proverbs, but also I put it in my book because I just, I love this so much. I've talked about this a lot, which is, where no counsel is, the people fall, but in the multitude of counselors, there's safety. You know, in the biblical sense, that's talking about um, God, Jesus Christ, and other things. But in this sense, in the business case, who do you call when you have a problem? Do you always go to your boss? What if the problem's about the boss? Think about that. Think about that safe zone that you can create that allows you to ask questions and bounce problems off of. Mentors have immensely shaped the way that I looked at my, my career. Um, I met with Terry this morning, as I shared with you. He's one of my mentors. I thanked him in the beginning. I got a chance to talk about all the cool stuff I'm doing at Bradford and all these new initiatives and all this stuff. And all of a sudden, he goes, did you think about this? I'm like, no. I didn't think about that. And I want to take that idea back into my career on Monday when I get back into the office. I'm going to figure out how can I implement or recommend that because it was such a great idea. Nobody has a monopoly on good ideas. Nobody. The smart Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, the smartest person that you know, they don't have a monopoly on good ideas. I'm sure somebody has a better idea. That's where mentors can help you. Mentors also help you move from the short-term focus to the long-term, okay? A good mentor. They're going to say, okay, give me your problem. I'll help you today. But what's that going to do long-term for you? That's a key, key lesson. Business today, if you pick up the Wall Street Journal, is too quarterly focused, in my opinion. Did we meet our projected numbers? Are we on track? Are we to budget? 
Those are incredible tools, and I'm going to talk to you about that. It's actually my fourth point. But in terms of your career, you are going to be working for 30 plus years, hopefully, unless you hit the lottery or you start up a business and you sell it. You're going to be working a long time. Think about the long-term implications of your decisions that you make when you're in your career. You can use mentors for quick questions and big questions, I've found. You can over, I would recommend overuse it. All right? I got three mentors. I know some people that have 10. I have some people that I know that have one. But I'd recommend use as many as you can. A lot of these associations, like in my industry, there's a bunch of um, utility associations, and there's HVAC associations, and there's, they all have mentorship programs. I literally have signed up for every one of them to be a mentee. You may be looking at me going, dude, what do you need a mentorship for now, right? You've made it. You're doing a lot of stuff. You're in the position you wanted to be. Took you 10 years, but you got there. The reason I do it is because I believe I can then turn the table and be the mentor. So I would recommend that in any case that you can sign up for mentorship programs, please look at that. Do it. There's an African uh, lesson out there called Each One Teach One. It's a pretty powerful, short little lesson. This is so relevant to mentorship, one that I've learned. I um, wanted to share with you a couple things that I, that I learned in mentoring. One was being, being uh, diplomatic was a strength of mine, and persuading people on big decisions is a, actually is a strength. Uh, I had to learn that in my job, but also I got sort of you know, uh, reinforced that when I talked to him about it with my mentors. Cause I, you know, he'd ask, how would you deal with the problem? And I went through boom, boom, boom. Oh, that, that means you're really good at that, and I have been. But here's the things that I learned in my mentorship that were failures. These are the things that the mentor pointed out to me. By the way, my wife couldn't point out to me because she's not in my job. My best friends can't point out to me because they don't deal with me every day in my career. Who else could point this out except the mentor, the person that maybe is closest to you from a career perspective? Two things. Ryan, you have a tendency to bulldoze projects. He told me that. He goes, from what you tell me, you don't care if it knocks another department out of the way. All you care about is getting your job done. What did that do to number two, the relationships? That was his lesson to me. The third thing, or another thing that he pointed out in the failures of mine, was I never took enough time to enjoy the ride. <laughs> Going from where I'm at today, I never said to myself, oh my God, am I ever going to do this again? Am I, will I ever get the chance to complete this project? We all take that for granted. Like, oh, it'll happen again. You all are young. I'm still young too. But enjoy the ride. That, is, that was a lesson that was a failure of mine because I didn't know how to do that. I was so focused on the future, I never said, oh my God, what about right now? What about this thing? That's important. That's really important. Um, doesn't matter how old you are, enjoy the ride. Just take that, that 10 minutes and go, oh my God, this is really cool. I didn't get a chance to do that. Not everybody gets to do that. I've written on the back of legends in my business. I'm sure there's plenty in the industries that you'll get into. There's lots here uh, at the college. And the last thing I'll mention about mentorship that served me well in my career is that if you say, excuse me, this is more of a, this is more of a tactic I've deployed. I've always went to my bosses and I've said, look, I have mentors, but you're still my boss. Is it a little forward of me to say, I want your job someday? And I've had bosses look at me and go, I think that that's a very good initiative on your part. Okay? Could it be ever perceived threatened? Yeah, maybe in my next company that if I ever work for one, maybe they'll say, yeah, don't ever come into my office and be like, I want your job, dude. Like, but it's always served me because what happens is when you're like, I want your job someday, is back to servant leadership, is tell me the things that you work on. What is the problems that you have? Help me think about those. Maybe they have a stretch assignment that they hadn't even thought of given to you. Going in there and saying that will make them think of you differently. Okay, it's not going in there and saying, I need a raise. Give me a new title. Give me all the stuff I've earned. It's saying, give me the experience. I'll put it on my back and I'll prove you that I can do it. And if I fail at it, I've learned something in that too. That's what... I think the mentorship programs and bosses and others can really help you do. Another thing um, really quick that I learned in my failures from being mentored was I had a goal, and I'm not afraid to say it in this room. I had a goal that 
In 2014, I wrote it down and I published these annual goals. I sent them to my family. I, sometimes I put them on my website. I wanted people to hold me accountable. I want to do this, this, and this, hold me accountable, right? Like that, I want to lose 10 pounds. Other people help you do that kind of goals. One of my goals was, I'm going to earn six figures by the age of 30. I was like, yeah, I'm going to get six figures. I showed that to my mentor. The first thing he did, he just took a red pen and he goes, it's the wrong goal. And I said, what do you mean? I said, I want to earn six figures by 30. He goes, it's the wrong goal. The right goal should be, what experiences, projects, or other things am I lacking that someday I will earn enough and build the trust that I can earn six figures of the company? See, I could have earned six figures t that, that year. I could have gone out and got a second job. I could have gone out and gone, done a lot of things. But to me, the financial driver was the wrong motivation. Maybe it's the right motivation for you all. It was wrong for me. Interestingly enough, I found that about a year after my goal of attaining it by the age of 30, so I was 31, I hit six figures. <laughs> but I did it on the way that he instructed me to, which was look for the experiences, put others first. All these things I'm talking about, because it will all add up. It all rolls up. Lastly, again, you probably have uh, heard this now uh, from me. I'm pretty goal-driven. Uh, my family and I, about three years ago, we developed a 30-year plan. <laughs> 30 years. You hear some businesses like, I don't know, do that. Well, I did that in my house because I felt like, okay, how much money are we going to save up? Where do we want to go? You know, what are we going to achieve? But three years ago, if you guys were doing the math, I didn't have children. <laughs> now I have two kids. So my goals have changed. So as good as goal planning is, be available and open to the fact that someday you may have to change parts of it, okay? But I am here to tell you in my 30-year goal document by, by 2021, my wife and I will be going to Greece and Israel. I hope you all hold me accountable to that because we are saving now to go there, all right? Oh, and here's a, a cheat sheet of um, one of the staff one-on-ones that I did with my mentor. He was really organized. He's like, I want you to write this all down so we would talk about it um, when we go in person. Number four, what gets measured gets better. Any, I keep saying that any accountants in the room have to be jumping through the ceiling because this is like right up their alley. Data, numbers, cool stuff, right? This is one of those lessons that when I started making, sort of molding myself to be a data-driven guy, was that nobody else was thinking data. They were all like, ah, go with the gut. What's the market kind of say? And we'd make decisions based on that. But I'm here to tell you is that the time you spend in statistics class, the times you spend in data analysis class, quantitative analysis, dare I say the accounting classes, you will be a leg up out in the workforce. Spend the time to know the numbers. Spend the time to understand what they mean. I have asked a million questions after I got hired about numbers because I wanted to know how could we get better? What were the things that we could be doing differently? And you don't know that unless you supplant it with data. Look, for those that have ever had weight loss goals, I, I've used that example again, you all use numbers there. It's no different. Apply numbers to goals. What gets measured gets better. So let me give you some examples. Uh, this is an income statement. Again, if you're in business, you're like, oh, oh an income statement. Uh, there's balance sheets. There's cash flow statements, right? Uh, I believe in the room that we left, Professor Molony. I think he had a class there. And I was in that room learning about journal entries. Um, I remember it. I remember the balance sheet. I remember probably the only thing I ever got right in that class was, oh, a balance sheet means the, the numbers at the bottom equal. Right? But this is an example of the Thermostat Recycling Corporation's income statement. Um, so for those, again, this is probably for those in business like, okay, I get it. So last year, uh, we did a year to date and we looked at total income. So we had $3.3 million in income and then versus the total expenses of $2.8 million, right? That was a pretty good year, putting that profit to the bottom line. But we were a nonprofit, so we didn't measure ourselves that way. But in a business case, that would be a pretty good thing to do. But notice something here. Revenue and income, there's more lines of stuff than there are lines of stuff over here with expenses. That's pretty typical. That's pretty typical in most businesses. Okay? 
Um, I got a chance to look at the income statement when I ran the nonprofit. It was really eye-opening. We had things to fix when I took it over. We had a lot of things to fix, one of which was salaries and overhead. Dashboards, KPIs, key performance indicators. There's a bunch of red on this chart. Um, this is something I developed. This is something I'm known for now. <laughs> I sort of made my way around, okay, anybody can come up with data, but what are you doing with the data that you derive? What are the metrics that will result in actions, okay? So in this case, this is the dashboard that I developed while I was at Thermostat Recycling Corporation. The top three are my key performance indicators. So take out the income statement for a second, right? Are we making money or not? That's more or less what that, that statement answers. This dashboard is saying, are we doing the right stuff or not? Are we doing the right stuff or not? And so in our case, we had three performance indicators, and then we broke it down by state. Each company is different. Each company is going to look at what are those key metrics that are important to me and me as a department, me as the company overall, me versus the industry. Do you understand this stuff? Again, you will be ahead of your competition. Talk about baselines. Talk about things like, okay, what time period are we measuring? You'll notice here in the state analysis, we're doing a year to year, year, year to date number against last year. Okay? You could slice this in rolling. You could slice this in a month to month look. There's all kinds of ways you can look at it. What's important to the businesses that you'll be in? Okay? Maybe the next paper you all have to write, you ought to talk about data metrics. Because this ends up in a lot of different discussions. Data-driven marketing, uh, decisions on you know, pu public policy. Data matters. Data matters. But I'm here to tell you, I've made a career on making decisions from data. All right? It's not just, you want to be the data producer guy? Fine. You can do that. You can be the, I'll write this report for you, Mr. or Mrs. So-and-so. You want to be the strategy guy, the executive level guy? You're going to look at this and go, what am I going to change based on these numbers and implement those changes? That is key. Another lesson in this that I've learned in my career, and I'll give you some other examples here. Uh, this is another chart. Um, so we talked about baselines. So in this case, we did a state over state analysis on returned uh, recycling containers back to our facility and one of the things that the, we looked at was how active were our recycling partners. And so you can see Rhode Island was just killing it. 74% of that entire state shipped a bin back in the year that we measured it. Anybody from Rhode Island here? I don't want to offend anybody. Okay. Well, you know why that is because you're so small. But um, there's not that many people there and a lot less um, buildings and things. But that's less important compared to how are we performing to the U.S. average or that the baseline metric Right? Think about baselines, averages, other data point. So in my case, in this case, I'm going, what the hell happened with New Hampshire, Montana, and Massachusetts as the executive? What can I be doing to change that to get them at least above the national average? This isn't good, guys. That's the kind of thinking that you're talking about at an executive level. This is a, a tool and tactic that I learned. I know it's spreadsheet heavy, but this is a tactic that I learned uh, getting my MBA. So Anybody here dealing with forecasting? Everybody heard of forecasting, right? You've heard of forecasting, weather forecasting. In our case, I ran an exponential smoothing model, which is the highlighted column there, based on historical collection numbers, right? My first day on the job at Bradford White, I said, I got this cool model I want to show you guys. I brought in their data guy that was already doing this, and he goes, what's exponential smoothing? Never heard of it. So what am I saying? I'm saying that data matters, and I think that it's boring. <laughs> it is really cumbersome dealing through spreadsheets. But I found that I found a niche in my business that nobody's looking at this stuff, and they're not synthesizing it. They're not understanding how to implement changes from this. One of the things that we looked at with data was that, I'll just give you the example. We were spending $80,000 a year, excuse me, $50,000 a year $50,000 a year to do uh, a project for us. We had to do this project every year that the company operated. So another 50,000, 50,000. We had done it for five years. All right, so $250,000 we had spent on this project. And, and I got to looking at data. I got to looking at our numbers. And I said, wait a second. 
what if we made a one-time investment to fix that problem so we didn't have to keep spending 50000 a year? How much would it cost me to do that? What I found out was the cost was 80000 okay? So within 1.5 years, take 80000 into the 50, I could pay back that investment by making a one-time investment for a, per, for a permanent solution. That is a huge lesson for me in my career. It didn't come about until I looked at the numbers, the data. What is the data suggesting to me? What can I be doing about that? Details matter. And the last thing I'd mention is accountants are our friends. I've mentioned a little bit of times about accountants, but accountants are our friends. They can help you do this stuff. But they are the only people that I've ever known that ever called me over three cents. Literally, I had an accountant call me and say, your books are off by three cents. So, Number five, arguing professionally. This is a very compelling thing that will be in any course of your lives, I feel like. <laughs> um, I've argued professionally at home. I've argued professionally uh, with, with my staff. I've argued professionally in front of literally my enemy in the environmental advocacy community. What I have found is that arguments have a bad name in the Trump era. You can actually disagree with somebody without being disagreeable. Do you understand that distinction? That's important. And in my case, I've found that faulty generalizations led to a lot of my arguments with professionally. Things like per capita is a great way to measure thermostats collected. I fought that battle and I won that battle. And I'm going to show you how I won that battle. And I'm going to give you the tool. So we had an environmental advocacy group that said that per capita was the only way to measure thermostats because everything in the recycling world was measured this way, right? They were measured by things like thermostats to people. That's what per capita breaks down to if you don't know that, per people. You hear this in trash. You're like, how many pounds of trash per people have we recycled? What I said to them, basing this on a somewhat solid logical argument is, well, I just had my first son who was just born a couple weeks ago, and I could tell you they didn't hand him a thermostat in the hospital. So are you telling me that thermostats to per capita is still a good argument? They looked at me in the face and said, yeah, it is. It's still the right argument. So I said, you know what? I'm not having that. So what I did was I went into the, the coffers, and I said, there's a way to have this battle. I developed the REI, the Recycling Effectiveness Index, and what it looked at was four factors. It said thermostats are not based on people, they're based on four factors. They're, pay, they're based on median income, because it, the, you can own a home, but you're not rich enough perhaps to replace the stuff in the home. That means that there's still a thermostat there possibly uh, with mercury in it. How many number of recycling locations were available in that state? In other words, what's your, what's your coverage? Number three was the no, uh, residential stock. So what's the count of residential buildings in your state versus let's say, uh, uh, commercial or other things. And lastly, what was the climate zone? Because climate zone had a big determinant of thermostats because it's seasonal. So we developed this index with um, a few folks externally to us. And we decided and we put it together and we ran the numbers. So there's an expected value, the standard error. So we should have been collecting this number, but instead we collected some delta or difference. So that equaled you know, the actual residual left over, which came with the REI. The REI then said if it was negative, zero or negative, it meant that you, that state was underperforming itself. But if it was zero or greater or positive, that meant that that state was actually performing better than expected. Oh, I couldn't wait. I couldn't wait to get into those per capita people, the Enviros, and I said, you know what? We are going to give you this data. But here's the thing. This state that we're talking about actually showed a positive REI, so the story was compelling. We supp supplemented that into a letter. All right, and this public, um, that's a little bit of, a, um, it's truncated, but we wrote this letter and we won that battle. They removed the per capita argument because it was based on generalizations and faulty logic. It was a fight, but we fought it professionally. 
You didn't hear me call them, whatever. I could have called them a lot of names. And I think in the age of the politics that we have today, arguing professionally in your career, being diplomatic will get you further than being on the other end. And I have, an, again, a case example where that succeeded. But at times, I will tell you, that in my career I've, I've learned that there's a balancing act in arguing professionally, particularly when you're negotiating. What I found, if you're on one side of an issue, think like a balancing system, okay? If you're on one side of an issue and the other side's here, sometimes you have to go to that other extreme or take the extreme position to somewhere end up in the middle. That happens. But that's good public policy to me. That's centrist not extremes. But sometimes you have to start there, but you end up a little better than where you were. And I found that in my career to be the case. So, all right, so those are my five lessons. So what am I doing in my future? Again, I talked to you about my 30-year goal, uh, 30 years document, and yeah, I'm going to Greece and Israel in a couple years because that's a goal of mine for my family. What am I doing in, in this industry? So, in this business, I'm working on water as an issue. This is a really interesting problem because without water, water heaters don't work. Without issues like scarcity of water, things like quality of water, those are things that we're going to be talking about from a public um, corporate voice standpoint. Why? Because my competition isn't, and it's value creating. And I also hope that folks like you in this room want to work for companies that believe so much in this message about the environmental uh, implications and also the ones uh, that, that at the end of the day, we're spending time, money, and effort towards improving these things. Take, uh, by the way, this manifested itself uh, recently in my inbox, the, uh, the Flint issue, okay? So for those following that issue, lead, the, the pipes for uh, water in that city were opened up to allow lead to come into the drinking water. It affected low-income customers of the water utility. They have damage control trying to manage this. Here's the thing nobody's talking about. Those water heaters that were in those homes are all damaged. It's been five years, nobody's replaced them. It's time that a water heater manufacturer stand up and we do something about that. We need to help that community and it's going to be good for our organization. The second project is social impact and sustainability. I'm working on a, uh, something right now about water heater recycling. We talked about end of life mercury thermostats. Well, we sell new water heaters today. What can we be doing to encourage the old ones to come back? How is that sustainable? Can we repurpose the steel to reuse it? By the way, I was just told this stat uh, Wednesday at my office. In Michigan, where we manufacture, we have 1,200 employees. We are the third largest steel user in the state. Who else would be number one and two? Take any guesses. Come on, Michigan. Auto guys. Ford, GM. We're behind them for steel usage. That's huge. So what are we doing about reusing that? If it's reusable, can we actually come up with a program? Is it sustainable? Um, and also on the social impact side, I talked a little bit about this low income push, but there's other projects that help our reputation, help us, help us not just sell more boxes and sell more units, but help people. The big one for me, and I think this all falls under um, social impact, is workforce development. You can see me in this bottom picture here. I'm actually in a, a classroom of uh, tech school folks that are right out of college. They're talking about learning how to be technical in the field, yet they don't know who's going to hire them. They have no clue. They also can't afford some of these guys to go to school in the, the tech. We're, so Bradford White is going to look at programs of apprenticeship programs, grants, other ways to get folks involved with this industry that aren't already in those rooms and pay for it. Because without the installers, those non-routine tasks that we talked about, they're going away, this business is going to go away. Um, we can't have that. Number four, Internet of Things and Connected Products. This is really cool. You guys ought to be all jumping all over this. This is really awesome. We are developing a product that today you can install it or get it installed in your home. You download an app and you view it right on your phone. Here's how it works. You go on vacation, you can set the water heater to vacation mode. Okay, so it won't be heating at 120 degrees, it's going to be heating at 50 degrees. Why? It saves energy. It's a huge tool. Our competitors are already in this space and they're, some are doing some other cool things there. But this app is going to let us monitor things like water flow in a home. What if you have a leak? 
leak detection is going to be built into the product. It's going to be really awesome. It's all connected to the Internet of Things. This is where the industry is going. HVAC equipment's already there. They're doing self-diagnosing units, and there's other apps and other things today. It's really cool. And in our business, I'm going to be working. This is an, a very key issue for me, and that's marketing driving sales instead of sales driving marketing. It was for years, the sales guys come in and say, we need an ad, slick. Produce an ad, marketing guys. Like, okay, produce the ad. But today, marketing is starting online. It's about brand reputation. It's about Amazons of the world. It's about delivering products. Marketing is going to have a bigger role in the HVACR business than sales did, and we're, I am going to be primed at the helm to lead us through that charge. To me, that's, that's our company's inflection point. It is. I'll also mention on my family and work-life balance, I think you're probably getting a, a sense here, is that how important that is to me. I think that when, when you have children and when you have um, maybe family issues, other things in, in your world, you have to put things into perspective. And when I made the decision to leave the thermostat company to go to Bradford White, that wasn't just driven by money. I got a counter offer at TRC to stay that I was going to leave almost 60% a year on the table. It wasn't about the money. For me, it was about what could I be doing to help my family? What was my best long-term play? What was the implications? For me, it was time to downshift a bit. Okay, I have a lot going on, but for me, doesn't mean I'm working less, it means I'm working differently. And in a way that was more strategic, maybe less the weeds. You will have those moments in your life that you have to put that into balance. Your career, family choices, maybe it's to go to grad school, maybe, you know, whatever. But the three mantras that I'm living by now is driving purpose, pride, and pleasure. By the way, that's not unique to me. That's in a book called The Blue Zones of Happiness. It's a great book. I'd recommend reading it. And it's one that I believe in foolhardily. Um, focus your life around those three things, and you'll, you'll always be, you'll always be uh, fulfilled. But you'll also be fulfilled in your career, too. Okay? It applies to both. So this is a funny picture. I love this picture. Uh, I was with the paint guys in an event. They're like, get in that, get in that costume. They <laughs> snapped a picture of it. Um, when you have passion, you're never going to work a day in your life. I haven't the last couple of years. I've, I love what I do, and I love this industry. But I'm going to tell you that the industry has mattered more to me than the actual job. I have always said, I can impact this business. I can do more. I can be everywhere almost. And that's the way I've approached it, and people respect that. So when you're looking for your next job in your career, I'd recommend you look obviously in the HVACR business. It's a great way to serve others. But I would say to you, look at the industry first and the actual job second, okay? Because you can learn the job. Start with the projects in mind, with the end in mind. You're kind of hearing me say that. I have 30-year goals documents, annual goals, you know, Think about that from, a, from your own perspective doing uh, Etown College projects. Those things, if you start with the end in mind, you will be further along the path than you will be as you started um, just trying to get the task done in the beginning. All right? uh, the other advice I would give here, you know, if you haven't picked up on this, is make sure that you reach for projects and experiences. You, know, you might be surprised at those answers from the stretch assignments, the boss. You know, don't, don't just do the job. Ask for other jobs that you could be doing. Um, balance your life. Keep a curious mind, and the last thing I will tell you, um, Ben Carson, uh, he was one of the presidential candidates, and he was out on the, the campaign trail, and he said something I've always stuck with me, which was, you know, how did you get so far to be a neurosurgeon? He said, I had a library card, and I had will. When you have a curious mind and you invest in yourself, you can accomplish a lot. Sometimes it's luck. Sometimes things just happen. But if you really roll up the sleeves, you will achieve the things that you want. But you've got to think about the end in mind. Use those mentors and think about the industry that you want to be in. So 
with that, I'll end with how I end a lot of my presentations, which is how can I help you all? How can I help you achieve the, the goals and the things that you want to achieve? I'm pretty active on LinkedIn, so please follow me there um, if any of you have accounts. And be happy to help you in any way that I can. So 